Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the online workshop on looking ahead to COP27 ecosystems in the latest IPCC report. Now, this um, workshop is organized by the Climate Change Equality Special Interest Group, uh, which is part of the British Ecological Society. I'm going to start with some very brief housekeeping. Uh, first to note that the session is being recorded and we would like to share it on the British Ecological Society YouTube channel in a few months time. What we ask people uh, joining this meeting that during presentation you keep your microphones muted, um, preferably also keep your um, video off and you can use the chat to ask questions. Now, after each presentation, we're gonna have a short Q&A session where you can use the chat to ask questions and the chair will be uh, reading them out loud. Uh, same as when we have the panel discussion, if you write your questions in the chat, I will read them out loud and the panelists will answer them. So very briefly, the agenda for today's uh, workshop, uh, starting now the introductions and housekeeping. Then we're gonna move into our first talk by Camille Parmesan on impacts of climate change, followed by a short Q&A session. Then a talk by Mike Moorcroft on adaptations to climate change, followed by a Q&A session. And then a talk by Pitt Smith on uh, mitigation, um, followed by a Q&A session. After these main key talks, we're gonna have some uh, short perspectives from members of the climate change um, SIG committee. And this will be followed by the panel discussion where you'd be able to ask uh, more in-depth questions to the panelists. And then we'll go through the workshop summary. So before we actually start the workshop, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Orly Rasgore and I'm a senior lecturer in ecology at the University of Exeter. And I'm also the chair of the British Ecological Society Climate Change Ecology Group. Uh, so today I'll be sharing this session. So what I would like to do now is uh, start with our first talk. So the first speaker today is uh, Professor Camille Parmesan. And Camille is an adjunct uh, director and professor at the Institute of Theoretical and Experimental Ecology, CNRS, in France. She's also a National Marine Aquarium Chair in the Public Understanding of Oceans and Human Health at Plymouth University, and a professor at the Department of uh, Geological Sciences at the University of Texas. Uh, Camille is the leading author of the IPCC Working Group 2 report. And Camille researches the impacts of climate change on uh, wildlife and has uh, been one of the first people really showing the impacts of climate change in terms of uh, range shifts um, uh, um, of different species. Now today Camille will be talking about uh, impacts of climate change. Okay, I assume that's my cue. There you go, please. Thank you. <laughs> so can everyone see my screen all right? Uh, yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to be here. It's, it's really exciting, all the things that are happening in preparation for COP27. And I sincerely hope that Britain is well represented there, uh, given recent events and um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. So since I'm the first talk, I did want to present IPCC uh, in general, uh, it's split into three working groups. I'm in uh, working group two, which is the impacts adaptation and vulnerability working group. And just to give you some idea that what I'll be talking about is supported by a, a huge number of, of authors and, and literature search. So in total, there are about 270 authors. We reviewed more than 34,000 scientific papers and had to deal with more than 60,000 comments on uh, during the three review periods that we had. And each comment has to be addressed. So it's, it's, a, it's a very intensively reviewed document. This is our chapter of I and Mike Moorcroft were coordinating lead authors along with Yongu Trisrat. And our chapter is on terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems and their services. Much of what I'll be presenting is directly from that chapter and you can now download it off the IPCC website. So I want to start with working group one, uh, the actual changes that have been seen to date and to remind people that we've to date had about 1.1 degrees centigrade warming. And to uh, also remind people, this is not an even warming across the planet. 
The land is generally warming more than the ocean, but in particular, these very high latitudes are warming quite a bit more than other latitudes, uh, principally because of a change in feedbacks from ice melting uh, into ocean. So climate change is already altering species abundances and distributions in multiple different ways. We're seeing extinctions of populations driven by increasing extreme events. These are generally along the warm range boundaries for those species. About half of monitored populations of about a thousand monitored populations have gone extinct. And this is a global analysis. So it, it's not even geographically, but certainly every continent is represented in this. There were more extinctions, I think surprisingly, there were more population extinctions in tropical zones than in temperate zones. So tropical species, even though they might appear to be more warm adapted are certainly not, uh, they are very sensitive to small levels of additional warming. Uh, the uh, population extinctions were very high in freshwater systems, 74% of the monitored, about half in marine and about half in terrestrial. And this has been shown with insects, birds, plants, mammals, fish, uh, so a lot of very different taxonomic groups. And we're starting to see in freshwater systems that ephemeral ponds, these sort of, you know, in my system in California, it's winter vulnerable pools, we're starting to lose those uh, that cycle and those areas are drying up so much that these systems are being lost entirely. We're also seeing colonization and expansions of species range boundaries at cool, eds, uh, cool edges. So this is something that's very obvious within the UK. And these two processes, extinctions at warm boundaries and colonizations at cool boundaries are leading to the poleward and upward rain shifts. And the reason I, I phrase it like that is many people still think that it's individuals getting hot and moving. That does happen with a few species that are more uh, highly dispersive, but by and large, the process of range movement is extinction and colonization processes, so much slower than an individual simply moving in a single year. Uh, we're seeing for, uh, the numbers that we were able to attribute to climate change was about among about 4,000 species that we were able to tease apart climate change from other land use changes, for example, that would impact species distributions. And for those about half of species are shifting ranges globally attributed to climate change. But I do wanna point out uh, there are new databases that have up to 12,000 species with documented changes over the long term, meaning more than 20 years. But those studies have not attempted to do an attribution to climate change. And what we're seeing is a much weaker level of poleward and upward range shifts, which is no big surprise. When you combine all drivers together, you have a lot of species that might um, be under pressure to move their range will not be able to because of dispersal barriers such as log agricultural areas and, and urban areas. So as we're seeing species move around the world, we are starting to see an increase in new novel hybridizations, for example, between the polar bear and the grizzly bear. Uh, and the grizzly bear is the same species as the European brown bear. So this is what the pure species look like, and they're you know, very different in many, many ways. And we're now starting to see these quite bizarre hybrids. They're becoming uh, relatively common in some populations. And in the Arctic, to, to remind you again, that's what's heating up the most of anywhere on the planet, we're actually seeing this among 10 species pairs or subspecies pairs that are hybridizing. And this includes seals, dolphins, and whales. So very, very charismatic species. We're also seeing mass mortality events, uh, primarily driven by increasing frequencies of heat waves, but also some by increasing droughts. We're seeing trees, mass mortality of trees globally. Uh, in Depending on the system, it's anywhere from 5 to 50% of trees are dying off to do to increased drought. We're seeing mass fish kills in freshwater lakes, mass fish kills in marine heat waves, uh, and including other organisms in those systems as well, but the, the hardcore numbers are often on the fish. And we're seeing birds, bats, and mammals killed in various heat waves. And just to, to point out what I mean by a mass mortality event, a single 
hot day in Australia led to the deaths of 45,000 flying foxes. We're starting to see the first extinctions of species that we can uh, very clearly relate to climate change. Uh, one is the Bramble Keys Malomus, this cute little uh, rodent that lived on uh, an island between the Guinea. This is the island. You can see it's very low lying. It's very small. This photo is almost the entire island. And repeated floodings due to increase in sea level rise as well as increase in storm surge just wiped away the habitat as well as the individuals themselves. And it was rendered ex uh, declared extinct in, I think, 2016. And then there's the golden toad, which probably many people have uh, heard about. We put the information together from many studies since the extinction and decided as a working group that this was another extinction deliberately um, directly related to climate change. And more or less it's because the cloud forest that this species lives in is having increasing days without cloud. Now, these are the two that we are very clearly associated with climate change, but there's evidence that many, many more species have been rendered um, extinct due to some interaction of climate change and another factor. In this case, what I'm showing here is the chytrid fungus, which is an invasive species in the new world. There were 122 species of amphibians that went extinct recently, despite living in very undisturbed habitats, uh, largely in Central America, but actually some of them were in other continents as well. At the time, these were blamed on the chytrid fungus, but multiple independent experiments in the lab since then, looking at the climate sensitivity of chytrid fungus, saw that there is a, it is very climate sensitive and the areas where these, at least 91 of these amphibians went extinct, those areas actually became more climatically suitable for chytrid fungus during the period in which these uh, species went extinct. So it's clear that the, you know, we declared two species, we assessed two species as being driven extinct from climate change, but it's clear that the true number when you consider interactions with other factors is much, much higher. Now, a key conclusion of working group two, uh, I'm switching gears a little bit here, is that human life, well-being, and economies are dependent upon healthy ecosystems. This is a, a big jump uh, forward from prior, prior reports, IPCC reports. I think probably the audience is used to seeing this, uh, those who are more trained in ecology, but having this be come out in a very interdisciplinary global report focused on climate change uh, is very powerful. And what I want to point out here is that this is coming. The reason this was able to be stated so clearly is that since the last report, we actually do have a lot of new studies, not just individual studies, but huge global meta-analyses that are pointing to this conclusion. For example, this one large meta-analysis of 64 studies showed a very strong positive synergy amongst eight critical regulating services and the uh, health of the ecosystem. In other words, healthier ecosystems were better at climate regulation, water provisioning, pest and disease control, and pollination of adjacent crops from native pollinators moving out of the undisturbed areas. And this second study, Again, a large global meta-analysis of 74 studies pointed to perhaps one of the key mechanisms for that is that when you get more species, you have an increase in asynchrony amongst the species. So during the year, there's always something that's active. And this increase in species number, which increases the asynchrony among species, leads directly to better ecosystem services. So if we look, as we look into the future, we looked at biodiversity loss in multiple different ways. Uh, since I've been talking about ecosystem services, I want to show you this one. It's, it's certainly, we also did an assessment of species extinctions that I'm not showing, but this one is trying to get at that loss of ecosystem services. 
how many species, how much loss of biodiversity leads to a reduction in functioning of those ecosystems. Well, again, we know from a, a large number of laboratory and field experiments that as little as 10% loss of species is noticeable in, in looking at the particular metric you have of ecosystem services. And so our cutoff here of a loss of 25% is actually already a loss of what we know uh, from these experiments to cause a decline in net productivity, pollinating services, et cetera. And you can see we're at 1.1 degrees centigrade now, even getting up just to 1.5 degrees centigrade, much of the land area, this didn't include marine, much of the land area is already projected to lose up to 25% of the species, uh, but not, not many at a higher rate. So if, if we just go up to two degrees centigrade, now you're starting to see some quite large areas that are losing up to 50% of the species projected. But when you get up to three degrees is when you start really seeing quite large areas where you've got more than 50 to more than 75% projected losses. Uh, and as, of course, as you go up to four degrees, that gets even worse. And as you're seeing losses of this magnitude, you really are expecting to see a decline, in, a very serious decline in fundamental services of those ecosystems. And this um, uh, burning embers diagram on the right is showing you that that tipping point between high to very high risk of loss of species diversity is somewhere between two and three degrees. So these processes that we're seeing changing, these ecological processes that are fundamentally changing are also driving important processes that help regulate Earth's climate. So this increased tree mortality from drought is on average 20% globally. We're seeing large increases in forest insect pest outbreaks. Uh, in, this is in northern and boreal forest. This results in very high emissions of carbon. This is just one example of the mountain pine beetle in British Columbia, but there are many, many more, and it is happening uh, throughout all of those northern and boreal sections. We're seeing an increase in fire risk. This map is actually from the last report, but it's a very nice map, so I include it here, showing the projected increase in risk over the next 100 years. And if you look at the recent output from working with group one as to what's already happened, they concluded that the weather conditions conducive to fires, so drier, hotter, windier weather has increased, and the length of fire seasons has increased. And if you then look at working group two, our working group, the impacts of that increase in fire weather has been that we're seeing an increase in burn area due to climate change, attributed to climate change globally, but in particular, we've got very good data for the Western US where we can quantify that and showed that the increase uh, has been a doubling of burn area in the Western USA. And it's not just an increase in burn area, you're getting very shifts in fire seasons. So California, uh, you know, it's been in the news a lot. You're getting fire, uh, it's a fire dependent system. We expect fire, but in the summertime, in the dry, hot summertime, and now you're getting fire during the supposed rainy season when you shouldn't be getting fire. So you're getting fire at different times of year. Um, you're getting it year round, actually, when it used to only be in July and August. Uh, and you're getting it in places that you don't expect, such as the peat soil burning in the Yorkshire Moors a few years ago. Peatlands uh, are globally very, very high carbon systems. And I bring this map up because it is 12% of the UK is declared as peatlands. It stores a huge amount of carbon. And the amount of carbon in UK peatlands is more than all the forest in the UK, Germany, and France combined. So it is a huge carbon store right now, but that carbon store is starting to uh, decompose due to drying, even in peatlands that are in undisturbed conditions, you're getting a drying effect in, in uh, quite a few areas. And the drying combined with the degradation of peatlands in the UK is driving about 13% of UK emissions. 
So all of these ecological processes that are already changing lead to a very high risk of, of from overshoot of irreversible positive climate feedback. So what do I mean by that? Overshoot is going over the two degrees centigrade uh, level that has been declared the level for dangerous climate change by the um, conferences of the parties, by these COP meetings, that one of which is coming up in a couple of weeks. And increasingly, as we emissions continue to increase, governments are starting to consider that an overshoot scenario will be quite likely. In other words, that we won't be able to stay below two degrees centigrade. So we'll go over for a few decades, but we'll keep up with the technology. We'll keep moving forward. And then in, in a few decades, we'll come back down to below two degrees or even 1.5. And that uh, what's not being recognized is the risks from that of all of these ecological processes that we've already started, the increase in insect outbreaks, the loss of trees from droughts, peatlands drying, tundra thawing, increased wildfires, all of these are shifting those systems from being historically carbon sinks to now being carbon sources in many years. At some point, they will tip over. There, there will be a tipping point when they get permanently in a state of decomposing their stored carbon and becoming a permanent carbon source. At that point, it won't matter very much what humans do to limit carbon emissions because the biosphere will have taken over the process of uh, controlling the climate. So we absolutely need to stay below this tipping point. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly where that is, but if you look at the burning ember chart, you see Estimates are that we risk going from moderate to high risk of carbon loss, again, somewhere between two and three degrees centigrade. So there's a window of opportunity warming, but it is small and getting very, very much smaller all the time, but there are still options. And one of our conclusions is that not only do humans depend upon nature, but various studies are showing that we need to protect something between 30 and 50% of the land, get it back into being healthy ecosystems and learn to live more in cohabitation with nature. So what I'm gonna end with is one of the key uh, objections to this is how do you protect 50% of the land and feed an ever-growing global population. So I just want to end with one note on this. Uh, the other speakers are going to be talking about this more, but just one that there's this view that food and biodiversity are in competition, direct competition with each other for the same land. And what I point out is that's not necessarily so. It depends very much on how we use that land. So this is a, a one example, meat production. Um, I'm a meat eater. I'm sure a lot of you are. If, if this is actually where we lived when we were in England was very much in a farming area. Uh, it was very high stocking density of the cows, continuous grazing. They used herbicides um, in conjunction with fertilizer to get the grass to grow. Uh, the cows were full of antibiotics and, and um, various things to keep diseases away. And sometimes they even would seed the land. And all the biodiversity was really confined to these hedgerows. You just, it was very sterile within, within the field. In the area where we live now, this is our farm where I'm actually talking to you from. It's a much lower stocking density. So in, a, in about 70 acres, we have, I think, eight cows right now, and they're only on for a very short time, a few weeks, you know, somewhere between four and six weeks. They, the farmers don't use herbicides at all. They don't seed. So this is a natural hay meadow and a much lower use of, of antibiotics and and other uh, things to keep the cows healthy. And I suspect that they simply stay healthier because they're at a much lower stocking density. And these, this is the biodiversity on our farm. It's absolutely incredible. Of course, I take the butterfly photos, but it's an amazing biodiversity. And we even have some quite rare species of butterflies that, that are rare across the whole of Europe. So just the final note is that, yes, uh, we need to protect and get back into good health, many restore many of the ecosystems we have, but there are ways of doing it if we do it carefully. 
if we do it um, as as Mike Moorcroft would say, in the right place at the right in the right way, there are ways of preserving both biodiversity and uh, food production and other uh, other aspects of the natural world that humans actually need to use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Camille, for a great talk. It's really, I mean, it's alarming and quite scary to see the situation that uh, the planet is in, but it's good to, that you ended up with a bit of a positive note on how things can be done and uh, promote adaptation to changes. I'm gonna open uh, the floor to questions. We have five minutes of questions from the audience and we already have one uh, from Marita Soisson asking that given how challenging uh, attribution can be, I would be really interested in how you went yeah. about isolating climate change impact as a variable from other factors when looking at species rain shift. Yeah, uh, so that is a great question. Uh, we did detail it in our chapter. So if you read the chapter, you'll see a whole section on how we did attribution. Um, when I talk about this with my undergraduates, I actually spend a two hour lecture on it. And I know you don't want that. So I will very, very quickly say that it is by um, a combination of things. It's one focusing more on lines of evidence rather than on direct experimentation, because of course you, what you have is a long-term trend in a particular population or, or species, um, and it hasn't been experimentally manipulated with warming. But you use lines of evidence. You try to focus on species that are in areas that appear to be relatively undisturbed, so relatively natural habitat. Uh, and regions that have had relatively little other change. So when I was talking about the hybridizations in the Arctic, that's very, very clearly driven by climate change because there is no other uh, type of land use change which could possibly be leading to these hybridizations. Um, and then it's a slew of, of, of putting together the evidence for that species from lab experiments or, or field experiments. And, tying the changes, long-term changes that we're seeing to some known mechanism for that particular species. And that's why, you know, I can say we do have this for about 4,000 species. We have data for about 12,000 now that's been published, but most of those, there's been no attempt at attribution. And so we absolutely can't say to what degree those changes were driven by climate change versus other land use changes. So I hope that was short enough. <laughs> No, thanks. And, and I think it's, it's quite a big issue. And it's a, something that a lot of people are a bit more skeptical about impacts of climate change. That's what they is raised a lot of the time, the effect of land use change versus climate change. Um, uh, while we're waiting for other people to ask questions, I had a question, actually, and it's about uh, we're talking a lot about loss of species. Uh, but what do you think about the interface between loss of species versus the loss of functional diversity? So we may be losing species, but as long as we're maintaining some functional diversity, is it actually sufficient? So it, a lot of the studies have tried to tackle that. So it's sort of teasing apart species richness from functional richness, if you want to say. Um, we didn't find enough high quality evidence to be able to make a statement on those two. Um, it's very difficult to study as as you probably can imagine. And there weren't very many studies that did it really well. So, you know, our chapter was a global chapter. We didn't feel we could come up with a global conclusion about functional versus species, uh, functional diversity versus species richness. But there are a lot of new studies that are underway right now. And I suspect by the next report, there'll be enough evidence to really assess whether there's a, um, whether we can tease those apart and and if we're careful about what species we put our priorities on perhaps we will be able to preserve ecosystem health at a lower species richness than right now it seems to be the case thanks for that and we got one last question just before we move on which is from jane fisher and tom barker asking are the ipcc reports such as yours able to present solutions such as the land use and management as well as present the data on the risks and losses. Yes, you're going to be hearing about that in the next two talks. So I, I, uh, it, and I should say that it is a big shift for IPCC to be, we were mandated with providing solutions, which is very, we all had to kind of struggle with because we're also mandated to be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. 
So the way we did it is by presenting, here's, here's the solution space, here are the different options that the literature has put forward, and here are the pluses and minuses. So trying not to be prescriptive about which option to take, but providing what we could find in terms of evidence as to the positive and negative, um, positive benefits and negative trade-offs between the different options. Uh, but I will have to say that, that the literature was not very good at providing um, as good an evidence as we would have liked, but you will hear about the conclusions that we were able to come with, up with in the next two talks. Brilliant, thank you, Camille. And this is a very nice interface to the next uh, speaker. So our next speaker for today is uh, Dr. Mike Moorcroft. And Mike is a principal specialist in climate change in natural England. He's also the coordinating lead author of the IPCC Working Group 2 report. Now, beyond that, Mike is also the original founder of the Biological <laughs> Society and Climate Change Ecology Group. Mike's research is uh, all around their climate change impacts, adaptation and mitigation, and really about applications to conservation uh, policy and practices. And today, Mike will be talking about climate change adaptations. Great. Thank you, Orly. Um... So I hope you can see my screen and I'll just need to run the presentation just a moment. Okay, hopefully you've got that. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so um, yes, adaptation. Uh, and, and that was a really good segue between Camille's talk and mine. So um, Camille and I were a bit of a double act really on, on chapter two uh, of our working group to report and, and Camille led more on the impact side and, and I more on the adaptation side that the well what are we going to do about it question um, but let me just uh, define adaptation for you and, and this is uh, this is what is in the glossary for working group two this time round and the, the, the understanding of it has developed a little bit over time and it does distinguish between human systems and natural systems uh, and this is something that biologists particularly often trip over when, when, when we use adaptation in the terms of, uh, of of climate change then it does tend to be a bit different to what a biologist means by it so adaptation then in human systems process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and it climate change and its effects in order to moderate harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. And in natural systems, the process of adjustment to actual climate and its effects and human intervention may facilitate adjustment to expected climate change and its effects. So it's all about adjustments to reduce risk. That, that's the point. We've got climate change, it's with us now, the impacts are staring us in the face and even with the best case scenarios of, re of re reducing emissions, we will have climate change to deal with for all of our lifetimes, our children's lifetimes, our grandchildren's lifetimes, um, and possibly beyond. So we need to adapt. And the natural world has some capacity to adapt, but it's going to need some help from us to give it the best possible chance. And at the moment, as Camille has indicated, we're not giving it best chance, we're actually making it harder. So I'm gonna go through some of the headline messages in our executive summary at the start of uh, chapter two uh, around terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems. So this, I'll, I'll be quoting some of the statements that we use there. And these are, these are IPCC confidence statements. Um, so if something has high confidence, it means there's a lot of evidence and the evidence is all pointing in the same direction. So high agreement and plenty of evidence. And we are able to say with that high confidence that the resilience of biodiversity and ecosystem services to climate change can be increased by human adaptation actions, including ecosystem protection and restoration. So that's the good news, I guess. Uh, and I, I, I'm not going to go through all the, the, the tables that I've put up there. You can go to the original report if you want to. But there are a number of things that make biodiversity and ecosystem services more resilient to climate change. And top of the list is having large areas of natural and semi-natural habitat. 
Um, but th there's a number of other different elements there as well. So we can reduce risks by managing the land better. Now, one of the things we like we we need to do we, we it's part of the role of the IPCC. It's the key role is actually between our successive reports, which typically come out at six, seven, eight year intervals, is to look. It's to focus on what's new. What what do we know now that we didn't know before? So we're in the sixth assessment re report now. What's new since the fifth assessment report? And one of the new things that have come up is that there is new evidence that species can persist locally in what are termed refugia, places where conditions are locally cooler and where populations of the same species, which may be declining elsewhere, can, can actually survive. And for the conservationist, and obviously my day job is in a conservation organisation, as a conservationist, you want to know where to prioritise your efforts, where you've got the best chance of success. And the little picture here shows a Joshua tree in Joshua Tree National Park in California. Um, it, that's that's the, the species in the foreground. Uh, there are some others in the background, but uh, we have a case study within the chapter that looks at what can be done to try and protect this rare species with a very localized distribution and a very climate specific population. Um, to look to where you can prioritize efforts where it's going to have the most chance of survival. Uh, and, and, and that's work done by the, the US National Park Service. And I think we can see going forward, there's, there's, there are opportunities and it's certainly something we're looking at here in the UK as well to see what, where we can take advantage of those refugia. Another statement, um, from our executive summary of, of chapter two. And I, I, I am, I've had to be very um, selective here as, as Camille was. We, there's an awful lot of pages in this report, something like 3000 across all the different chapters and um, you know, a couple of hundred in hours alone. So it's a very selective uh, look at different elements of it. But one of the things we did find, which is perhaps the less positive in news is that since our last report, there have been many adaptation plans and strategies developed to protect ecosystems and biodiversity. You know, the UK has a, a national adaptation program. Um, we had a question from Mary de Soisson, uh, who's uh, very involved in that in the UK. Um, but there are a lot of plans. Natural England has a plan. Lots of people have plans. The trouble is there's limited evidence of how much those plans are being put into action. And when it is, even less evaluation of whether it's effective or not. And, and that I think is a really important message for the scientific community, for us. Not only do we have to shift from detecting the impacts of climate change to develop strategies to deal with climate change, we also need to test if they're working or not. And I, I've just, taken the liberty of uh, highlighting a paper that came out in, in biological conservation recently by my colleagues, Simon Duffield and a couple of others of us, where we actually did look at our own national nature reserves that we manage in natural England, both at their vulnerability, but also how much progress there was with adaptation. And, you know, we're putting our hands up here. There's a lot of work to do. We know what the issues are, but we're only just starting really to, to to do something about it and that's that's one of my challenges going forward is to do more and to test how effective it is when we do um a bit more on the gloom side i'm afraid and that's the ecosystem restoration resilience building all of the adaptation measures we talked about and they also include things that can target individual species um, but they can't prevent all impacts of climate change. And planning adaptation needs to manage inevitable changes to species distributions, ecosystem structure, and also ecological processes. We, the fact that we can already see distributions changing 
Um, and I'd also say we can see the coastline eroding, we can see habitats changing character, for example, wetlands becoming more drier systems around the margins of their range. The fact that change is happening now means that if you work in conservation or land management, you have to deal with a new reality. Yes, we want to reduce vulnerability, but we also need to plan for change for the best outcome that we can get within the change circumstance. And I, I've shown here a photograph of, of a mountain ringlet butterfly, um, species I'm, I find is a really wonderful case study of this. It's, it's one of very few UK species, pretty much the only UK butterfly species that's a true mountain high altitude specialist and just clings on to the top of the Lake District fells in England. It's more abundant in Scotland, but um, I, I had a PhD student uh, complete in the last year, uh, Melissa Minter, working at the University of York, um, Jane Hill and Chris Thomas uh, uh, and colleagues, and, and really had a good look at those species, because we know this is moving, we know it's disappearing from the bottom end of its range, and we are going to have to plan for that change. I'm going to change the focus a bit. I called the, the talk um, adaptation for people as well as for biodiversity. And one of the really key developments of the last few years is looking at how we can manage nature better in order to reduce the risks that climate change presents to people. And that's sometimes termed ecosystem-based adaptation. And we can see really quite a good development of the evidence here that by restoring um, natural habitats or semi-natural habitats, we can actually help to protect, protect people from the impacts of climate change and bring other benefits as well. So just a selection of examples here, you can create shady spaces with trees within cities. And um, as has been pointed out to me, there's nothing actually that new about that. Go to any of the warmer parts of the world that support tree growth and you'll typically find city squares with trees in for shade. Um, that's something we, we can learn from. We, we know now how much difference that makes to temperature. It's a few degrees and it's worth having during a heat wave. But there's also the way water is managed, increasing risks of flood to people. And um, the middle photograph here is an example from the catchment of Thirlmere Reservoir in the Lake District, where the river system has been allowed to become more natural. And in, in this particular area here, there's been a natural colonization of trees would have naturally been there but were cleared for grazing for some of that intensive agriculture that, that Camille mentioned and actually by a more natural system with the river meandering and flowing with it, the, 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 the dry land allowed to flood in a heavy rainfall event and trees falling into the stream that can slow the flow and help to protect people but also critical infrastructure like drinking water supplies uh, during those extreme events. And similarly on the coast, we've had a big push for managed realignment, actually allowing the coastline to roll back in some places. Uh, and we know these things can work. And, and as the evidence base has got stronger, you can build the case for more action. Now you may have heard the term ecosystem-based adaptation, but it's um, it's really just a subset of a much wider concept of nature-based solutions. And, and I put up there a, a definition that was agreed at the UN Environment Assembly earlier this year. It's quite a mouthful, but um, it boy, I'll just pick out the key elements of it. So it's actions to protect, conserve, restore, sustainably use, manage natural and other ecosystems simultaneously providing um, human well-being, ecosystem services, resilience and biodiversity benefits. Um, and in the context of climate change, it's often applied to taking up carbon from the atmosphere, uh, particularly with tree planting, um, but it also includes reducing risks through ecosystem-based adaptation. I could give you a long talk about the definition of nature-based solutions, and I 
not going to because there isn't time but it, it is actually quite a, a tricky area to say what is and isn't a nature-based solution but one thing that we were able to conclude very strongly was that to realize the benefits and avoid harm it's essential that ecosystem-based adaptation so the adaptation element of, of nbs is deployed in the right place with the right approach for that area um, and that is a bit of a mantra of, of mine doing the right thing in the right place the right way um, with inclusive governance as well um, the human dimension comes in here and i've put up a picture of mangroves because we know that mangroves are great uh, reducing the impacts of rising sea level and storm surges on coastal communities, people, as well as nature. But we also know they've been done, they've been created really badly in some places, wrong species in the wrong place, not involving the local community. That's the point about inclusive governance. And actually, they can cause more harm than, than good when that happens. So having a good, strong evidence base to deploy ecosystem-based adaptation really matters. It's also important to realize that there are limitations. Ecosystem-based adaptation and other nature-based solutions are themselves vulnerable to climate change impacts. If you create a forest to take up carbon or to slow water flow, but it's, uh, it, it's poorly managed or it's of species that are vulnerable to fire, for example, then the benefits can quickly be lost. Just stepping back from the narrow um, ecosystem points, we found across the piece that adaptation on adaptation has increased, but the progress is uneven. We're, we're not keeping pace. The climate's change of changing faster than people are adapting to it. So there's a real need to accelerate adaptation. And there's a whole number of things here um, which I'm not going to go into I think for an audience of ecologists but it's important to be aware that actually things like political commitment institutional frameworks finance are actually uh, the things that are often holding us back here it's also important to see climate change adaptation within a bigger picture of what we've termed in working group two, climate resilient development. So there's a different elements of this, the need to reduce climate risks, the adaptation, but also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, enhance biodiversity, and all sat within the wider sustainable development goals that set out the UN agreed approach to the priorities for, for sustainable development. But one of the key things here, and this builds on some of the stuff Camille was saying, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but actually within our overall summary for policymakers, and you might have to squint to read it, so I'll read it out, but we have got a line here that, that the conservation of approximately 30 to 50% of Earth's land, freshwater and ocean areas, um, including near natural ecosystems it, it is essential for that broader climate resilient development uh, and that, that's a big step and it is important and it links with processes um in the not just in the cop of the climate change convention but also the convention on biological diversity of the un i'm, I'm starting to come towards the end and i'm going to stray slightly into territory that pete might cover um, but we also were charged with looking at the impacts of, of climate change mitigation measures, so including things like tree planting. And one of the key messages that came out is actually one of the impacts of climate change can be indirectly when people do uh, um, land-based mitigation badly. So, for example, plowing peatland like here to plant trees, uh, releasing more carbon than they um, then they're going to sequester in the trees, causing havoc with all kinds of stuff, including the biodiversity. So another point about that joined up approach being really important. And so um, the climate resilient development framework includes ecosystems, but alongside a whole raft of other things. 
including in issues around equity and justice and involving marginalised groups who often suffer the effects of climate change worse. So I just want to finish with some reflections for COP27. It seems to me we're clear on one thing. There's urgency, urgency for both adaptation and mitigation. But there's also a need for a really joined up approach within the wider sustainable development context. Ecology has to be seen within that broader concept. There's no getting away. We need finance. And if any, you know anything about international climate negotiations, particularly there's a challenge to get the developed countries to deliver what they've said they will to the, the developing countries. And yes, ecosystems need to be at the heart of climate change adaptation. And the, this is uh, the concluding evidence-based statement in our um, summary for policymakers, the overall summary of the, the whole report, not just the ecosystem bit, that any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. There's no time to lose. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Mike, for a great talk. Uh, we already have one question from the audience. So I'll start with a question from Debbie asking, I wonder if adaptations that encourage larger, more coherent habitat areas may be more prone to larger areas of um, wildfire and pest or pathogen risk. If this is expected, are there, are there combined adaptations that could address these multiple risks? Yes, I mean, I think this is one of the things that that, that is quite location specific. Um, and it can go either way. Uh, I mean, within a highly managed forest system, things like fire breaks are obviously introduced um, and for pest and pathogen control you know sanitation measures of clearing trees for example um you know are used the flip side though is you also have a situation in, in places like well the examine uh, the the amazon to choose a you know uh, an example that's perhaps on some of our minds with brazilian election results you know actually the risk of wildfire has been much increased by fragmentation of the amazon and the opening it, uh, uh, up of it with roads going in and um of deforestation um so sometimes but not always um and and yeah you're right it does need a joined up approach and and certainly in a fragmented country like ours i think the emphasis generally needs to be on larger sites than we have now um but there's also undoubtedly an issue around for example um, the, uh, managing the risk of, of people lighting fires um but yeah so <laughs> sorry simple question quite a complicated answer but ultimately it's it's again it's doing the right thing in the right place yeah and i think that's quite an important message just coming through here because like you showed a lot of the tree planting if it's done in the wrong place can actually have the opposite impact than expected so we have a comment from marie here which is not a question but a comment uh, support for Mike's call on the need to monitor and assess whether plants are translating into on the ground action and whether those actions are actually working. So a fundamental element of adaptive management and uh, tweaking, improving as we go along. And uh, finally, we have a question from uh, Gina asking, you mentioned that there were no or hardly any evaluation of the effectiveness of adaptation measures in scientific literature. What or how can we improve to, um, to align uh, politics and science uh, to approach this issue and make sure this is continuous and not only until the next election? Yeah, this is something that's that's uh, a big priority for me and, and it's more on the mitigation side, but um, we, we've got a pilot study running at the moment, which we got money from the UK Treasury for um, to do pilot studies of nature-based solutions for climate change, particularly for the carbon storage and sequestration. Um, and it's really tightly linked with, um, with monitoring and evaluation and research around it. So 
I, I think develop pilot studies, I think are a really good way. So, you know, we, we learn by doing, um, we set something up, we try, you know, creating a new habitat or restoring it, um, but we do it in an experimental way. We monitor whether it works or not. And I'm really keen that we do push that much, you know, much more than historically been done. Thank you for that, Mike. So um, I think we're going to move now to our next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Pete Smith, uh, who's a fellow of the Royal Society and a fellow of the Royal Society for Biology, as long as uh, several other societies. Uh, Pete is a professor of soils and global change at the University of Aberdeen and is the science director of Scotland's Climate Exchange. Uh, Pete is the leading author on the IPCC Working Group 3 report. Pete's research focuses on impacts of global change on ecosystem soils and agriculture and land-based options uh, to mitigate climate change. And this is what Pete is going to talk to us today about climate change mitigation. Thanks, Ollie. Just share my screen. There we go. Right. I could have given a very nice talk about how mitigation measures and biodiversity can be synergized, but that is not the talk I'm going to give today because that wasn't really the outcome from the working group three of the six assessment report, which really focused on uh, mitigation measures that that um, can be um, can be put in place, and a number of a number of those are actually ecosystem based approaches. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Biodiversity and nature are considered in the context of the feasibility of those options, and in in the context of the co benefits and the trade offs that occur with those options. So that's mainly where I'm going to be talking about how that um, how that influences the things that BES are mainly interested in. Um, so starting off, um, uh, if we look at the the atmosphere and uh, the land surface and the oceans, what how they interact with climate change. Um, we have, obviously, we have uh, our, our trees, um, uh, our natural land, and our, um, our um, managed land, for example, for crops, uh, which both absorb CO2 from the atmosphere um, and fix it by photosynthesis and also release it um, through respiration, autotrophic and heterotrophic respiration. Then on the managed land, we have additional um, emissions of predominantly methane and nitrous oxide um, from, from, for example, cattle and fertilizer management. Uh, we have land use change where we intervene in the land surface and we chop down uh, forests uh, to clear land for agriculture, for example. Um, so that, that land use change also releases CO2 to the atmosphere. And some of that can be used for substituting for fossil fuels um, through bioenergy which has implications as well. Um, so there's a, both a, a, a sort of a, 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 a positive impact on the climate there and potentially also a negative impact on climate and biodiversity. We'll come back to that. Um, and of course, in our oceans, we've also got pho photosynthetic CO2 up uptake and we've got respiration from, from algae, um, for example. So this is just a brief summary of just the the, the main processes involved in greenhouse gas emissions and uptake um, in the biosphere. So most of the uh, slides that I'm going to be using are from chapter 12 of the uh, the sixth assessment report, working group three, which is the the, the um, chapter covering a folu. So that agriculture, forestry, and other land use. You'll notice that the um, the it's based almost entirely on the land. And there's not much said in the mitigation chapters um, about uh, the uh, blue carbon and what can be done for mitigation. That's because most of the readily uh, manageable options, um, including those uh, on the coastal fringe, such as mangroves and salt marshes, are within the land sector. Um, so um, most of the emissions and most of the uh, most of the sinks that are discussed are in this chapter, uh, which uh, which focuses on Otholu. So this is the breakdown on emissions and how they've changed over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and we've got uh, uh, Lulu CF, so that's land use, land use change and forestry contributing uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. 
um, quite a lot of enteric fermentation uh, from predominantly from uh, domestic ruminants. We've got CO2 and N2O emissions from managed soils and pastures, uh, manure management, synthetic fertilizer application and biomass burn, burning, making up a smaller proportion of the, of the emissions. But this is how they've changed over the years. You can see the Lulu CF um, uh, CO2 emissions have gone up uh, during the last decade, whereas they've more or less stabilized uh, uh, in the 1990 to 2000 period. Um, so that marks a, a, a change for the worse. And <coughs> enteric fermentation emissions have also gone up uh, in the last decade. So that's where we are at the minute. And we can look at the, um, the removals and emissions uh, from the sector in terms of the regional breakdown. And you can see that the, the, um, the distribution of the different sources uh, varies quite a lot between countries. So in Africa, Latin America, and uh, Southeast Asia, for example, uh, the flux of, of is largely due to uh, largely coming from the uh, Lulu CF sector. So this is um, from uh, forestry and other sectors. Um, the the red band is, uh, as on the last slide, is the enteric methane uh, emissions, and those are also quite large in Latin America and Africa, but smaller in Southeast Asia. And so, so on and so forth. You can see the the, the, the different contribution uh, in total emissions from the different continents, the different regions, and you can also see the different balance of sources of emissions uh, between the different regions as well. There are big differences in the carbon dioxide sink and source strength depending on the method used. Um, if you look at these different methods um, shown uh, uh, at the bottom here is the earth observation, uh, the forest sink, which is meant to be a, a sink of about six gigatons uh, per year. Um, and that contrasts with a, a significant source of uh, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. When we look at the um, uh, dynamic uh, global vegetation models, the DGBM and uh, national greenhouse gas inventories, and also the bookkeeping methods um, where, we, where we have the uh, the estimates which are taking account of all changes in every land use parcel on the planet. And those differ again from the FAO statistics and from the National Greenhouse Gas Inventories. So we have a very wide, wide range of estimates and some of those, they don't even agree on sign uh, whether we are, uh, uh, whether our land base is a sink or a source. So there's significant scientific un un uncertainty which we have to reduce in the future. That's partly due to um, a, a difference in the way with, uh, that we account for those different methods. So if we look at gre uh, national greenhouse gas inventories in the top right quadrant here, um, that includes both managed land and indirect human induced effects and natural effects. Um, but when we look at the bookkeeping models, the DGBMs and the integrated assessment models, they're only having a look at direct effect on the managed land. So there is a solution. We could put this together in different ways by combining the different approaches to get a best, better estimate of the sinks. And that's something that science is doing moving forward to get a better estimate of the, um, of the sink or source strength of our land. If we have a look at the main sources of methane and nitrous oxide, moving on to the other gases, you can see that enteric fermentation is the major source of methane emissions, um, uh, contributing a large proportion um, and it doesn't matter really whether you use EDGAR, FEO stat, or the US EPA databases, they're all pulling in more or less the same direction. They differ in the, in the actual amounts, but they're, they all show the same sort of uh, relative contribution. Uh, so smaller contributions from manure management. Uh, the second largest contribution is from rice management uh, with uh, agricultural biomass burning making up the other, the other uh, part of the pie. Um, in terms of N2O emissions, agricultural soils um, have the, the, the largest emissions, mainly from the application of fertilizer and nitrous oxide emissions from those. But uh, manure management and biomass burning also having an impact. And the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, of uh, methane and nitrous oxide are shown here in CO2 equivalents, gigatons of CO2 equivalents uh, between the different databases. And you can see that they've increased in all databases uh, over the years, over the decades, 1990 to 2019. 
and there are also regional differences as as we showed earlier on with the um with the, the total emissions uh, there are differences in uh, methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions which differ between uh, regions so the largest proportion of uh, uh, foal of emissions, uh, forestry and land, other land use come in Africa and in Southeast Asia, as you might expect, uh, with other contributions from nitrous oxide, from uh, uh, rice cultivation for, for methane and for nitrous oxide, from other management of agricultural soils. Uh, the chapter also looks at the factors affecting deforestation. Uh, so deforestation being one of the main uh, sources of uh, 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 differences in the, the CO2 emissions to the atmosphere. And those that show uh, that are consistent with less deforestation are shown over here on the left with law enforcement, protected areas, payment for ecosystem services, for example, going through to those in the middle, uh, to those that lead to more deforestation, uh, agricultural activity going up to higher agricultural prices, driving more land clearing and driving further deforestation. So we have policy levers that control, uh, uh, that can control uh, rates of deforestation loss and can control to a large extent the carbon sink or source strength. So that's good. That's a good thing in that we know that there are policy levers that, that we can intervene in to try and support some of these, uh, so to reduce deforestation and to, um, to increase uh, forest cover. We also know that there have been changing drivers. So I've shown those emissions, but the global trend, trends in the drivers is just as important um, where we can see the global trends. Let's just focus on that for the moment. We've had a large increase of end fertilizer use uh, over the last three decades. Uh, total agricultural areas stayed about the same. Um, and the uh, the distribution of the cropland areas have stayed about the same, but the main driver uh, for the nitrous oxide emissions has been that increase. But those global trends um, hide some trends in different regions. Um, so the different different regions have different trends, particularly in fertilizer use. Um, so that was in Asia in the developing Pacific. There was a large increase. Uh, uh, going back to that one, there was a large increase in nitrogen fertilizer use, uh, which has driven a great increase in uh, nitrous oxide emissions. And the other drivers, of course, are animal numbers. And these are the uh, horses, uh, horses, mules, asses, camels, sheep and goats, pigs, cattle and buffalo and poultry. And you can see that there's a massive increase in poultry um, in a number of regions, uh, in, in fact, increasing in just about every region, even in countries. Um, which are showing declining trends in other form, and, and other forms of animal numbers. Um, so the poultry is the big increase, but there are also big increases in cattle and buffalo in Latin America, um, and big increases in sheep and goats, for example, in Africa and Asia and the developing Pacific. So these drivers that are driving changes uh, in the emissions are also driving changes in biodiversity, because we know that animal agriculture is a significant contributor to biodiversity loss, especially when it leads to uh, increased intensification of land and land clearing uh, for agricultural purposes. That brings us on to the thing that Mike, uh, Mike mentioned uh, briefly, which is, is the, the measures that we can use um, uh, for mitigation purposes um, that don't necessarily have uh, uh, very good implications for biodiversity. This is just showing uh, the projected mitigation. So the current policy mitigation gets us nowhere to, towards where we need to be. Um, uh, the integrated assessment model show, uh, show that we can declining, uh, but the sectoral studies and those including BECs and demand side measures uh, from a mitigation perspective, get us far greater mitigation uh, and, and a far greater land sink. I'll come back onto BECs in a moment. So this is an impossible to read uh, graph, which I tried to cut and paste into this into this talk, but I don't think it comes across very well. This is looking at the um, the different measures and their contribution um, with a technical potential, the economic potential in light blue, uh, and the IM potential that that in the integrated assessment models in dark blue for the different uh, interventions. So the top one there is reduced deforestation and degradation, a large uh, potential. Uh, the other one that has a large mitigation potential is bioenergy and BECs. 
<laughs> which potentially has quite a large contribution. The other ones, for example, afforestation, reforestation, improved forest management, and so we go down through the through the other measures. But if we have a look at the um, the, the the circles that are shown uh, in a grey colour, this is where there is a risk associated with them for either food security, livelihoods, biodiversity, water, soil, air quality, and resilience. And you can see that uh, BEX has a number of risks associated with it um, for, bi for uh, biodiversity and for food security in particular, and large scale afforestation also shows some of these risks. So this is the, the extent to which uh, biodiversity is taken account of directly within the report. And as I say, the uh, joint report that was released by IPCC and ITBES is actually much more informative and does a much deeper dive on the mitigation, adaptation and biodiversity co-benefits. So the regional mitigation potential um, is, is shown here um, in the different, different countries. So uh, it, the technical potential is greatest in Asia, uh, then Latin America, then other developed countries, Middle East and Africa, and uh, uh, Eastern Europe and West Central Asia. And quite a significant potential there, both for uh, reduced emissions and sequestering carbon in agriculture, shown on the left-hand side of the graph. And the forestry options, uh, manage, protect, restore, um, are shown over here, um, going through to the red in the middle of the graph. And the demand side measures, so that's uh, changing to more plant-based diets, sustainable, healthy diets, and reduce food loss and waste are showing quite significant contributions shown in brown here, which add on to the top of the other measures that we have available in the forestry and the agricultural sectors. So I'll just finish off with a study that um, contributed to the to the uh, assessment report, but these are the these are the um, figures taken from the, the paper that was published in Nature Climate Change whilst we were putting together that chapter. Um, I think which it sh just shows it a little more clearly. This shows what the contribution of the land sector could be to a 1.5 degree world. Um, so we have a significant uh, proportion of mitigation here, 4.6 gigatons from reduced deforestation and degradation, conservation of mangroves uh, and, and reduction of peatland burning. So quite a significant uh, mitigation potential uh, through those actions, all of which would contribute positively to biodiversity. Reduced emissions from agriculture, which is shown in this uh, one gigaton in this brown slice, and that's broken down by reducing livestock emissions, rice, cropland nutrient management and fertilizers. The shift to a plant-based plant diet gives us nearly a gigaton of mitigation, and reduced food loss and waste gives us another gigaton of, of mitigation. So that's about three tons of mitigation available there in agriculture. Uh, both from reduced emissions and from reduced food loss and waste and for dietary change to more sustainable uh, practices, more sustainable diets rather. Um, so reducing, uh, reducing forests is shown in the blue part of the pie here in the middle, um, reducing, uh, restoring forests, mangroves and drain peatlands has a real um, significant mitigation potential of about 3.6 gigatons and then the remaining uh, proportion here is things like uh, supporting actions, which are uh, uh, R&D investment and deployment of BECs and uh, improved forest management and agroforestry and enhanced soil carbon 1.6 gigatons uh, uh, potentially per year in the land sector. So it, it requires not just changes in the way that we manage our land, but in the amount that we put aside uh, by reducing deforestation, by restoring lands that have already been degraded, and also uh, managing our agricultural lands better. And all of these would uh, contribute positively towards biodiversity, save perhaps for the um, uh, large-scale afforestation and uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which could in impinge upon biodiversity if done at scale. So, um, just to summarise, I think there's significant mitigation potential in the FOLU sector. So the land-based sector has a significant potential to contribute. There's less focus on marine ecosystems in the mitigation literature, 
simply because the options of the levers aren't as developed for mitigation. Um, so it's far better covered, I think, in working group two. And you heard from Camille and Mike about um, uh, some examples from marine systems uh, there, uh, which do uh, suffer the impacts and do have to adapt. That's why they feature more strongly in volumes one and uh, volume two, especially of um, the mitigation uh, uh, of the IPCC uh, assessment reports. Some options, in fact, most have co-benefits with biodiversity if they're implemented well, but some such as large scale afforestation and BECs pose a risk to biodiversity. So either need to be avoided or the risk to be managed, for example, by growing bioenergy within sustainably managed landscapes at smaller scales. I'd say the IPCC is getting better at considering the wider implications of ecosystem-based mitigation actions. Um, only 20 years ago, I think it was pretty much, uh, pretty much just focused on the amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions that we could get or the carbon sinks that we could get from those actions without considering the wider implications. But it's getting better at that, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I think we need more primary research on the interactions between mitigation action biodiversity and the delivery of ecosystem services, because the IPCC, after all, can only summarise the work that's available in the literature. So we have to do the primary research. As BES, we have to get that information out there so that they can be considered by IPCC in the next assessment round and also by ETBES going forward. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Pete, for a great talk. And it's really interesting to see the different avenues and their contribution. While we're waiting for people to ask some questions, I had a question myself, and it's perhaps about how, how this can actually be implemented. Uh, so on the one hand, you were showing how agricultural soils are the main contributed contribution to nitrogen dioxide emissions uh, due to fertilizers. But on the other hand, we have an issue with a growing human population, growing demand for food and issues of food security. So there is these quite strong pressures towards more fertilizer input. And especially if we're thinking about, OK, we don't want agriculture to come in the expense of uh, forests or, or other uh, wild habitats. So how do you find the balance between the two here? I think regionally it's quite different, uh, quite different uh, in, in the solutions that you would apply. There are some areas where you could argue that we could we could be getting more from our agricultural land by applying a little bit more nitrogen fertilizer, particularly where none is applied. So in lots of Africa, um, yields are very low and land is being cleared for more and more agriculture when it might be more um, advantageous for biodiversity and for humans and for food security to just apply a little nitrogen fertilizer and to, to get the optimum uh, growth of the, of the crops in those areas. There are other areas where food security has been prioritized and China being a good example, which is China's done a great job of uh, ensuring food security for its for its enormous population. But that's come at the extent of um, uh, environmental pollution and degradation through the over fertilization of, uh, of, of nitrogen fertilizer in particular. And that's 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 something that's being addressed that the Chinese government recognize. And it's working internationally to reduce that, both for the benefit of its its own people and also for the benefit of the planet. So there, there are these things sort of maybe a, if you looked at it from a global perspective, there, there could be a redistribution, you know, prevent the over fertilization in China and India and maybe apply a little bit more in Africa. So there's no one size fits all situation, but it's easy to what I say it's easy. It's relatively easy to identify the win win options that can co-deliver to food security and biodiversity and mitigation and adaptation. And that was the subject of the IPC, IPCC special report on land, which looked at the intersection of all these sectors. And we find that there, there are um, more, more mitigation options than not contribute positively to all of those, uh, all of those things, give co-benefits for all of those things if implemented in the right way. Brilliant, thanks for that. That's really in a way, a clear way forward, uh, which is, I think, very important to put here. Uh, we have a question here. Um, I can't identify uh, the person, but they're asking, uh, has there been any research into potential reduction of uh, enteric emissions uh, through the changes in grazing from highly fertilized grasslands to more natural grasslands or habitats? 
yes, there's there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of research out there, both from the both from the point of view of the sustainability of the ecosystem in terms of soil carbon and in terms of the biodiversity that's provided by grazing ruminant. But there's also uh, a lot of evidence out there on uh, how it affects the enteric methane emissions. And the enteric, unfortunately, <laughs> the way that it comes out is the, the enteric emissions per unit of product are actually lower from the industrial farms livestock. Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons. I'm not saying go and do that. There's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't want to do that, animal welfare and human health and stuff considered. But because you're getting animals, you, if, you, if, you, if you contain them and feed them concentrates all their life, you get them up to slaughter weight much more quickly. They're eating a diet of concentrates, which has less roughage, uh, less, less, less uh, fibrous material, so there are less methane emissions. So there are less methane emissions per unit of product when you produce uh, ruminant meat in that way. Now, I think it's a, a totally dumb way to, 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 to raise human, human, to raise products for human food. There are so much more efficient ways of doing it. And that also demonstrates, I think, the point of that, that the, the point that I made earlier about not looking at these issues through, through greenhouse gas blinkers. So mm -hmm. if, if we did just look through greenhouse gas blinkers, we'd say, let's, let's do factory farming, there's less emissions. But there are so many other disbenefits from it, I wouldn't, wouldn't push that at all. Thanks for that. And uh, we got another question uh, asking, lots of papers show uh, poultry and set, et cetera, um, to have lower emissions than other animals. Therefore, do you think that an increase in poultry could be a more sustainable protein um, uh, than beef or ruminants and would lead to a low, lower emission than not as low as plant proteins? So does the report uh, model impact of our potential future diets and changes in food? Yeah, so we know uh, switch away from ruminants to 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 white meats, to poultry, and even to pork um, could significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There have been studies on that, uh, but it's an order of magnitude less than the than the change that we get if we switch to plant based pl plant based foods. So it's a sort of a way of going part way towards where we need to be. But I think we need to be we overconsume protein by about uh, seventy to one hundred percent in developed countries. So getting our protein is not an issue. And I think we could develop more sustainable, healthy diets that are better for human health and planetary diets by including more plant-based products in, in the diets. Uh, Camille's put something in the chat about reducing methane emissions by dietary additives. Yeah, there are a number of dietary additives that have been used. Things like linseed reduce the methane emissions uh, by 15 to 20%, but that's a relatively short-lived um, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. There are other, other ones with a long chemical, which the short name short name of which is 3NOP, which, which seems to be have a longer lasting effect on reducing methane emissions. The problem with that is you can only feed it when you're feeding concentrate. So if you're doing grass-fed cattle, it's difficult to get that 3NOP into the animal. You can't get it in by applying it to grazing land. So that only really works for the, the period of confinement or for dairy cattle, for example, when they're indoors. So again, there are some technical measures uh, that can be used that can make a contribution, but I think the demand side measures have been underexplored and have a greater potential also for biodiversity. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point here yeah, about the mitigation measures that ultimately you, you shouldn't just go for one approach. We should really look at the, all the different mitigation options and their impacts beyond just uh, what we're trying to do there. Brilliant. So thanks for that, Pete. And uh, we're going to move now into a short, a short section where we're going to have some perspectives from uh, members of the climate change uh, group of the British Ecological Society. So the first person I'd like to invite to turn the microphone and to turn the camera on is uh, Charlotte Nadibre. Are you here, Charlotte? Yes, I hope you can see me. I can hear you, but I, I can't see you. What did you say? I can hear you. Oh, excellent. I can see you now as oh, well. Okay, okay. Hi, Oli. Hey, yeah. So I'll start by introducing Charlotte. Charlotte is the international representative of um, the Climate Change Ecology uh, SIG. And uh, Charlotte, I'll give you the floor to say a few words. Okay. Um, I just would like to thank Permacin for her talk, uh, Mike as well, and um, 
the last speaker. I'm sorry, uh, while he was speaking, I had some technical challenges, but I was able to follow through um, the talk from impact uh, to um, adaptation and mitigation. And uh, I want to tie this just very quickly to the scenario in Africa, because we've got a lot of um, unique ecosystems in Africa, just like, of course, you have elsewhere, and a lot of um, small islands. But we have um, a large uncertainty about what would be the outcome, of course, like with most other parts of the world. But it's quite alarming that just this year alone, 24 countries in Africa were in the news for flooding, and in Nigeria, where I come from in particular, um, there were uh, 1.3 million people displaced from the central part of the country um, due to flooding. And I've 600, about 600 people uh, died in the floods. So, I mean, there are, there are lots of um, you know, terrible things already we see with climate change. There are organizations existing and emerging ones, uh, such as the African Union, the UNECA, the um, AFDBP, and um, the African Blue Economy Alliance that are, you know, alarmed at all of these events and are trying to do something, you know, to stop the uh, negative trends. And there are so many talks also online. I noticed that there were a lot of uh, demands on social media, you know, targeted towards um, COP27. I just want to say that one of them particularly stood out for me. It is the um, African Feminist Task uh, Force for COP27. Maybe it stood out because I am a woman and I saw that there were African women and girls demands for COP27. They came out with 27 demands for COP27 and uh, they were arranged in six categories, mainly um, from gender, inclusivity and transformative change to representation in leadership and uh, down to you know, technology. Um, but what I see most in the, these demands is the inactions, you know, we keep talking about climate actions, but I see it, um, more of the inactions as opposed to the actions. And I just would like to say that we need some innovation, you know, climate, some innovation around um, climate change, you know, to bail us out. Because if we do not do anything now, I mean, it will get increasingly alarming. Thank you very much, Oli. Thank you, Charlotte, uh, for this really important call to arms and to really make meaningful change out of this COP. Uh, so the next person who's going to give us some perspectives is Izzy Thompson, who's the student representative of the climate change uh, SIG. So, um, hi, can you see me? Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, I'm Izzy. I'm a fourth year student of marine biology. Um, and I, I was when I was asked this, I was like, "What can I present to a group of uh, ecologists who are way better qualified than I am to talk about any of this kind of stuff?" Um, so I figured I'd just talk about um, what coming into uh, conservation fields is like um, when you when you've been raised essentially on climate change and like the hopelessness of the future. Um, so like climate change and this sort of prospect of like a dying world has shaped my entire education um, since I wanted, I decided I wanted to go into this field. I wanted to be a marine biologist since I was 12. Um, and so much of like the media that as soon as I decided this, my parents obviously like fed me with all of this media um, so that I would like continue my passion. Obviously like you think about Blue Planet and I was reading book, books like Half Earth and Frozen Earth that explain the history and also like potential solutions to it. And I've been reading these kind of media since I was very young and watching the news, which talks about flooding and talks about so much like sad displacement that's happening because of climate change. And as uh, Charlotte was saying, like, in action. Um, and I, I think that coming into this field from this angle, um, and your entire perspective is shaped by it. It causes a lot of like, existential like fear about the future, which I've also seen in a lot of my peers, even that haven't wanted to go into conservation, um, a fear of what the future will happen and, and what the world that we're coming into will have for us. And 
I think that there's like a stage that a lot of my friends have gone through that I've gone through of like almost hopelessness like well what's the point in trying to trying to help trying to make things different if it's already been ruined but I think that what I have come to like I I've wanted to make even small changes in my life ever since I was like I've been vegetarian since I was 14 and a lot of my friends and colleagues like in university and outside have also wanted to make small things like I think there's there's hope in in the new generation coming through of scientists that that small things like like was talked about like switching your form of proteins can have an effect even if it's just you that starts and then your friends start and people carrying around like metal straws so that plastic isn't used which isn't a huge issue but it's more so the awareness behind it um and I think that although there's a lot of like pessimism um in the media and a lot of like general uh, things I think that even the fact that we do have things like COP27 where scientists come together and discuss and try to have a cooperation between policymakers and uh, technicians and everyone that like goes into actually making a difference is really hopeful and I think that um, if we continue I can I think that things can be different and I think that now is the time for change and as was previously said now is it's just about action there's research there that's ongoing there's passion there's so many things that are going on it's just we need yeah action and I um and I think that's something that I feel very keenly and I know a lot of the people um of my peers feel like as we're learning about it and everything that we're seeing is completely changed by climate change that action is what is important and that hopefully we and everyone here is obviously will be a part of that um yeah thank you for listening thank you izzy and it's really good to, uh, to see this rising awareness and uh actually will to to really bring about uh, real change thank you so the last uh, person who's going to give us a perspective is gina Kolzenberg, who is the early career research representative and the vice chair of the british ecological society climate change group thank you orly and thank you for everyone who spoke before me um i just really want to continue where izzy left off and say that starting with the students moving on to the early career researchers um we are basically at the forefront of climate change research and the research and development and um development of techniques for application for these um new applications that are coming out so we can solve the problems if we are a bit creative and if we um just like easy have the drive to just do it and um, this is why like an event like this where we um can come together with the authors of such an important report um is for me personally one of the biggest things because I can then directly get involved and I can ask how I can get involved and also it is the first time really where students or especially also our career researchers um, get into depth and actually get in touch um, with the actual IPCC report and not just hear about it indirectly um, via their lectures for example. And um, yeah, it forms really, for me as a climate change um, early career scientist, it forms the basis of my reading and has a lot of uh, valuable references. And again, I thank you to all the authors to compile it in that document to make it easier really for us um, as the um, upcoming generation to solve these problems, to have a go-to document and try to figure out um, what what is um, the most important for our field and where we can go back to and uh, continue working on um yeah so it is it is really good to have these reports again to create this bigger picture because i i'm sure all of us know that if you work on your studies and if you um work on even if it's a multiple project, but your kind of field, it is very easy to get lost in the nitty gritty and uh, to not see the bigger picture. So again, this report, <clears throat> sorry, is very important, I think, 
for um, all of us, no matter which stage we are at, to come back to it and actually uh, read in it and have the bigger picture and see how everything combines, which we then can take um, forward to work together with um, with policy makers and with politicians to be able to create um, solutions for the future. Thank you very much, Gina, for really highlighting the contribution of these kind of reports uh, for people's research and also for pushing uh, policymakers and pushing change. So we're going to move now to the panel discussion, and I'm going to ask um, Camille, Mike and Pete to turn their cameras on. And I'm going to open uh, the floor to questions, uh, but I would like to start uh, by asking a question myself. And this is really about you know, from quite a UK perspective, perhaps, but about the political will. And uh, we've seen here leading to the COP27, a real waning political will with uh, prime ministers refusing to even come to and attend and engage with the COP. And I'm wondering, uh, from your perspective, what do you think is really the key direction that the COPs uh, should take to counteract this waning political will and to push for more meaningful actions uh, from governments? I'll start and say that's one reason why um, actually quite late in the game, we decided we needed to emphasize the risk of overshoot in it to, to pull it up to the summary for policymakers is because uh, we felt like there has been increasingly this feeling on the part of governments that, okay, yes, we, we had this international agreement in Paris that we should limit warming to two degrees and, and even try to go to 1.5, but and that's not really going to happen. So we're going to go to plan B. And, you know, we had all the information in our report, but, but as I said, we had to, the summary for policymakers is only like 12 pages long. And so we had to really think what are the absolute most important messages out of this, you know, what, three or 4,000 page report. And we did decide that they we needed to get it across to policymakers. And this was not just our chapter, this was across the whole working group. We had to do a better job of getting across the risk of going up to three degrees or or even four degrees is possible. That there is this enormous risk that we will, you know, we've already started this train in motion changing these ecological processes, causing these systems to shift from being sinks to sources. We know that's already happening. We don't know the extent because we don't have enough monitoring, but knowing it's already happening at 1.1 degrees. So there's this train starting to go downhill and we have no point. We have no idea whether it's two and a half, three or three and a half that is gonna tip those systems over into being the dominant force driving Earth's climate. And I, I, when we're trying to uh, get this across to the governments in the defense of the SPM, I could see that they really hadn't thought this through, you know, in thinking that it's okay to go up to three or four degrees for a few decades. So I'm hoping that, that the, uh, you know, Mike is one of the people actually able to physically go to COP27 and I'm hoping that those scientists who are going to be at COP27 will help move this message forward to a greater number of, of politicians than were actually present at our, at our SPM defense. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a funny business, COP. I mean, I, I went to the one in Glasgow. That was my first experience. Um, there's such a a sort of collision of different sort of vested interests there. Um, you know, you've got lobbying from the NGOs. You've also got lobbying from um, commercial interests as well. Some of them well-intentioned, some perhaps less so. Um, and very different perspectives of different nations. You know, it's a really hard ask. And a lot of the work is going on sort of not exactly behind closed doors, but in really, in really detailed discussions of country representatives, you know, and what I'm doing, they're probably not even listening to. I mean, hopefully it's feeding through, 
but you know actually there's a lot of people there you know struggling over you know two or three lines of text literally and whether they're putting things are going in and out of square brackets it's a job i i, I have a great admiration for and, but couldn't do but but ultimately those negotiators need the drive and the steer given to them by by governments and actually by the heads of government and heads of state so that's the kind of deal with getting the the heads of government or the heads of state to come for the first couple of days so this is all the question will rishi go or not um i think he's sort of slightly rode back so we'll, we'll see he may get there we'll see but it, you know at that level you need that that level of support right from the top to actually give the steer to the, the negotiators to make it really happen, to give it impetus and to make the difficult decisions. Um, but ultimately, all those people are looking over their shoulder at their own electorate. And, you, you know, the crazy, you know, the crazy politics of the last couple of months in the UK, you know, the chain, you know, the financial markets have had to say, but also the, the sort of the volatility in the the populace as well. And um, as you know, it's a cliche, but we get the politicians we deserve, or at least the ones we vote for. And actually, you know, it, there's a fine balancing act between the. All, you need everything moving together to get action on this. You you need public support. You need the civil society movements all pushing clearly one way you need the politics you need the really detailed policy wonkery uh, the, you know the people who really fiddle with the text and then of course you need the science behind it which which we provide and if you haven't got all of those it isn't going to happen so that's why it's difficult but um but let's you know don't give up because i you know you as we've seen things can change quite quickly in politics you know look at brazil um you know, we are in so much better place as a world, you know, for a, a Lula rather than a Bolsonaro presidency. Um, yeah. I was going to say similar things. Um, politics changes and it swings from left to right all over the place. You know, we saw with Trump, Trump uh, switching to Biden two years ago in the US. Lula has just taken over from Bolsonaro a big step forward. Uh, but in this country, we've seen the chaos uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, last couple of months, um, Boris Johnson, for all his faults, did was fairly committed, or that administration was fairly committed to to COP26 and doing something positive on climate change. The the last administration, brief last administration, was entirely unconcerned with it and seemed to be doing everything to break it. And Sunak has not done anything that I can see so far. To, to to reverse a lot of the damage that was done uh, by the trust government, apart from cancelling the fracking ban. Um, but he's not got any track record of um, of having any interest in the environment. You look at his budget that he released just before COP25, uh, COP26 rather, um, and there was no mention of, of climate change in the budget, despite the fact that uh, they were all going to, going to Glasgow for the COP the next week. So I don't hold out much hope. Politics changes, and all we can do is keep the scientific message straight and clear, as Mike and Camille have said. Um, so it does take all of those things to be in place, but they're never all in place in every country in the world. So we just have to hope that we, if we keep banging away, there's enough to get a, a global uh, consensus to move things forward. Thanks, everyone. And I think this is really a big issue with global issues like global climate change that ultimately you need international collaboration and cooperation. Uh, we have a question here from Gina. Um, how can one get involved in the IPCC reports and try to make a difference? And do you have to be at a certain stage of your career to be able to join the team of authors in any chapter or special report? Uh, yes, Pete. I can take that one. So the process for, for um, becoming an author is you have to put in your CV to the UK government. There's usually a call for IPCC authors and you put in your CV and what you want to contribute to and if all of the working groups and then you may, um, may or may not be selected. To be honest, um, you've got more chance of, be, of being selected if you've already got a track record of publications behind you. So it's a bit chicken and egg. It's a bit difficult to get involved. But there are other ways to get involved. There are things called chapter scientists, where the chapter uh, they're allocated to each chapter, 
um, and they can be early career scientists or even PhD students who are interested in the work, um, who assist the chapter um, in pu pulling together evidence, uh, pulling together information, drawing excellent figures, um, and doing stuff which um, I won't I won't describe as dog's body work because it's more than that, but it does get you involved in the process. You see how it works and you see how it develops, and you can get involved in the publications that arise arise from that. So you can get involved at any career stage, um, but to be a lead author or a convening lead author, you probably have to get to a late early career stage before before that's before that's likely. Thanks for that. And that's good to know that also early career researchers can get involved in the process. Uh, I, was, I was wondering if Charlotte or Izzy, you had any questions to ask uh, coming from your perspectives? Um, I just want to ask um, about, you know, like there's a lot of talk about climate information recently. And uh, I attended a course. Oh, sorry, I think my video. I thought my video was on. Um, I, I attended a course, uh, the faculty collaborative held by some professors in the US. And one of them was talking about climate theater, like taking the whole talk about climate change to the arts. And, you know, has that been a new innovation in that space? So I'm just wondering what can we do better? What can we do differently, you know, to improve on our inactions? That's just my question. Well, I'll, I'll take so uh, artists have been involved in trying to convey the climate change message for a very long time. I remember going to the COP meetings in Denmark back in 2009, and the town was full of rep artistic representations, sculptures, um, uh, performance art, movies that were conveying the, the, the science of climate change, really. They were, they were brilliant and doing it in a way that um, I've certainly taken to heart myself when, when I give presentations, I think, okay, how would it, what, what would get, a, get the same message across to someone who doesn't want to see lots of graphs and, you know, data tables and whatnot. And so I, I think there are increasingly art science collaborations that are very effectively doing this. I would like to see more governments providing the funding for these kind of, of interactive collaborations. But to date, I've, what I've seen is more, you know, the artist and scientist trying, having to find their own funding. So if, I, I do think it would be great if we had dedicated funding for these art science collaborations. I think it's very powerful, very effective. Thanks, Camille. Did anyone else wanna mention anything or wanna respond to this? Okay, so I'm going to move to Izzy. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Um, no, I think mine was pretty similar to Charlotte's. Um. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, back to the <laughs> audience, and if anyone in the audience had a question that they wanted to ask. Just, just while people are thinking, I, I think just to broaden it slightly, uh, um, you know, I think the arts are a very good medium, but just generally, I think we've learned a lot more about how to communicate climate change. I still think the IPCC is uh, is not always the best. We write these massively long talks and you know and and on sorry long reports and and you know I think the, the SPM was supposed to be about twelve pages, but then by the time the governments have gone through and told us it should be shorter, and then that we've included all the extra stuff they've asked to add, you know, it's got to thirty odd pages, you know, and it, it, it's uh, um, trying to be precise in your language, which you know the IPCC has taken huge pains to get right and to be really well calibrated about confidence and things like that. It does make it quite hard for people to understand. Um, and I, there's been a real push this time to do better on some of the sort of media communications, um, back sheets and things like that. And I, I think we've got a lot further to go. Um, but, um, but I mean, one of the things that hampered communications for our report anyway was the, the invasion of Ukraine. It happened as we were literally getting the final sign off and, you know, it we launched the report on a world that, you know, its mind was elsewhere. So, um, you know, trying to work better to take, to be more opportunistic when there is an opportunity in the news, I think, rather than when there isn't, I, I think is, 
is also important. That's quite an interesting point also about these um, unexpected world events that can have a massive impact, not only on the will to adapt or mitigate the impacts of climate change, but also on actual climate change itself and uh, the use of fossil fuels in the world. I'm really highlighting the link between uh, fossil, fuel, fossil fuels and security. And we have a question here from Gina asking, uh, through your research and working on the reports and participating at various COPs, uh, you have come across a huge amount of literature and knowledge. Are there any shocking revelations for yourselves that you were not really aware of before? Yes, Pete. Yeah, not, not through reading papers or anything specifically, but, but it's, it's been a revelation to me uh, from my own experience, learning experience, the importance of indig indigenous and local knowledge. I'm very much from a um, northern western European science thing where nothing's right unless it's published in a scientific paper and it's got confidence intervals and stuff. And that's my way of looking at the world. But seeing the other world views out there, I think, has been really enlightening and, and enriching for me to see that there are other ways of looking at the world outside this uh, reductivist scientific way. And those opinions, those 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 viewpoints and those worldviews are just as important as the one as, as the ones from Western science. So for me, that's been a, a learning experience and a growing experience. That, that's a good point. I mean, it's been really quite exciting having that perspective coming in and I can we'll, we'll have more of that I'm sure but one thing that struck me is the and it is actually in our chapter and I I can't remember Camille who it came from possibly Patrick Gonzalez but or it may have been from you um that there's more carbon in peat permafrost forests ecosystems than there is in unexploited fossil fuels because you know that's where the overshoot thing becomes you know really really scary that actually that's the point at which you can't control it i mean camille said it but that that really sort of came home to me yeah that was patrick gonzalez uh really pulled together the carbon uh storage uh data just beautifully did brilliant brilliant job at that and that i'll follow on by saying that is the thing that surprised me most is how many how many studies have been showing that undisturbed supposedly healthy ecosystems have already shifted from being carbon sinks to carbon sources i com combined with as you say the fact that the biosphere actually stores enormously the i should say the active biosphere stores enormously more carbon than than the than what's in fossil fuels it's very it's scary. I mean, you know, I am a scientist, but I'm also a human being. And I really found that combination of information quite scary. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we got somebody who's got their hands up. Uh, Owen, would you like to uh, join the conversation? Thank you. Um, I suppose it's, it's kind of a question about urgency, and I really um, welcome the kind of the calls to, to action that have come come through um, and I wonder as kind of uh, as you wrote this book um, right sorry as you wrote these chapters to put forward I mean so in in reality we've got about 80 odd months to pretty much half admissions if we're going to roll back some of this climate catastrophe that's coming down the track do you feel that in putting this together that the message is landing um, and if not what do we do to communicate that? Uh, Pete, please. Yeah, I, d I don't think there's a problem with the message. It's been communicated loudly and clearly, but there is a problem with it landing. I think especially with the, the political upheaval that's happened in the last the last year or so with the uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in particular and the energy price spikes and the cost of living crisis people's attention have been drawn away from existential threats that are gonna maybe affect us in 20 years time or 20, 2030 looks a long way off when you can't pay your electricity bill and your fuel bill this week. So I think partly it's attention has been dragged away from the public. It's more difficult to focus attention on climate change, which 
uh, it just started to just started to bite. It just started. We just started to get traction. And now it seems that we've lost some of that momentum and some of that traction is lost in the face of what of, of, of events that have happened. So that's one thing. Um, no, I'll leave it there, actually. Let others speak. Thanks, Pete. Uh, did anyone else want to add to that? Yes, Mike. Yeah, I think there's no easy answers, but you know there are positive signs, and I think there's there's a fine line to tread between um, despair and and hope, and 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 I think it was it was easy talked about that, you know, and actually, you know, it's not hopeless. I think there is another sort of there is a risk that you know people think. Uh, we can't do anything about it, it's all too late. You know, that's absolutely not true. Every fraction of a degree matters. If we can't hold it to one and a half degrees, well, 1.6 is still a hell of a lot better than two or three or or whatever, you know. So every fraction of a degree is worth fighting for. Um, and I think, how do we really get traction? I think, I think, you know, to look at some of the positives, I think you look certainly in the UK at energy supply and the numbers there are the emissions are steadily falling and you know things like renewables are growing offshore wind the costs now are much cheaper than gas much and i think you know we need to sort of you need the heart and mind bit but you always or the, you know, the heart and soul bit but you also need some of the the sort of hard nose facts and figures around finance i think business is much much more clued up to, to it than people give credit for um you know you hear about the bad guys you know the exons of this world but there's a lot of very progressive businesses out there as well and they don't want to be on the wrong side of history so you know i think change can happen very quickly in some certainly in some of the technological sectors i think one of the problems we have in ecology is that often a lot of the processes are very slow so you know you want trees to take carbon out of the atmosphere even in the right place you've got to get them in the ground now if they're going to do any any good you know by uh 2050 never mind 2030 but some of the technological stuff sometimes you know if you get if things go well you can change overnight uh, i used to show a slide of a of, of an led light bulb as a slide as a sort of picture of hope in um you know because it is it, a fraction of what a tungsten filament uses in terms of co2 emissions and power i don't show it anymore because everyone's got them but actually that was a step change in emissions um you know so it, i think it, it's yeah i'll i'll let camille come in <laughs> yeah i wanted to follow up on that to to say that i actually do have hope because increasingly the most economic practical solutions to a particular problem facing you know a, a city or a location is a, a more green solution. So I'll give you a couple of examples uh, from my home state of Texas, very right wing, um, in general, very anti environment, a particularly right wing town called Georgetown, several years ago shifted its entire it, it had a, a the city um, electric company was run by the city, it shifted entirely to renewable energies several years ago, because they did the numbers and figured out that actually in the long term that was going to be the most efficient, uh, cheapest electricity to have. And the, the, I remember an interview by, with the mayor where he said, I, I don't believe in climate change. This isn't done to have anything to do with climate change. It's just that was the right thing to do. So, you know, increasingly these practical decisions are ending up going green because it's just obviously the best solution to the problem. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we got time for maybe we can squeeze in one more question. I'll just note that there was a comment here about behavioral changes and the importance of collaborating with psychologists and communicators and the media to really move changes. Uh, we have a comment a question here for Marie asking, saying that uh, Catherine uh, Brown, uh, Climate Change Adaptation Director from the Wildlife Trust, put it really well regarding whether adaptation is uh, ad is admission could risk the fittest. Uh, discontinuation of action to decarbonize. Oh, sorry, I'm finding it difficult. Uh, we need to adapt to climate change that is already locked in. However, there is still so much we can and must accelerate uh, current and future 
and decarbonisation and reduce climate change impact post 2050. Adaptation and mitigation are complementary and both necessary. They are not mutually exclusive. So I wonder if um, any one of the panelists wanted to say uh, some last words just before we close, close the session. Well, I think on that one, I think you know, adaptation has often been the Cinderella um, compared to mitigation, it, it, you know, and we, we clearly need to do both and we need a joined up approach. Um, you know, it's climate change is here and now, but we can adapt and we need to adapt. Um, and, uh, but we, yeah, but we also need to get those emissions down as soon as we can um, to allow us to adapt. Yeah, I would just say immediate and aggressive reduction in greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors is absolutely necessary because nature based solutions can't do can't just there's not enough to do it to do it by itself. But we can use nature to to benefit biodiversity and provide mitigation and adaptation. So I think that a number of interventions can go co deliver to all of them, but we have to remember we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's not a substitute. And I think I'd just like to add that an awful lot is being done locally and across small regions. You don't have to wait for huge international agreements on emissions reductions to take action locally. And that I'm seeing a lot of movement uh, that's, you know, from the from the ground up grassroots movements that are just, you know, going way past what their governments have agreed on. So there, there is hope. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, really, I think it's a good note to end with the fact that even though things do look like doom and gloom, there is still hope. And there are a lot of people who are pushing for change. So I wanted to just end, end by thanking all our panelists and thanking everyone who participated and asked uh, questions. And uh, we are intending on uploading this uh, to the BS YouTube channel in a few months time, if people are interested in viewing this again. So thank you very much, everyone.